Good evening everyone, this is Ryan Hoyme, aka Massage Nerd, and tonight this show is brought to you by our friends at Massage Magazine Insurance Plus. Massage Magazine has been exploring touch therapies for over 25 years and use the industry's knowledge to develop the best value liability insurance in the business. And tonight we have a special guest again, Susan Yates. Hi, Susan. Hi, I'm coming to you from England. Yep. <laughs> and you're, you're actually supposed to be sleeping right now, so... Yeah, exactly. It's, it's the middle of the night, yep. so... I'll do my best. Yep, and um, she's she's a known expert uh, in pregnancy massage and many other things we're going to be discussing tonight. So please feel free to ask any kind of questions in the chat area, and I'll ask Susan those questions then, okay? So um, what have you been doing since the last time? The last time, yeah, I, it was just before my trip to the U.S. So I came and I taught in U the U.S. and Canada. Um, I was teaching mostly shatsu courses, um, but I did do a little bit of massage, and I was in Canada and America. And then since then, I've been back here, and I've been teaching in French and Spanish. And I was in Zurich last week, teaching with a German translation, and I'm off to Amsterdam tomorrow to teach. Wow. <laughs> How do you fit it all in, then? How do I fit it all in? Yeah. Well, my life is quite busy. But, yeah, I teach for, like, three or four days courses at a time, and then I'm back for a week or so. So that's how I fit it all in. It, and is it hard, hard worth an interpreter, then? It does take longer, I must admit, because I, I had my interpreter last weekend in Zurich, and I speak it all in English, and then it has to be translated. So it takes some of the spontaneity. And I was just beginning to learn a bit uh, German German, but Swiss German is different. So I really don't understand Swiss German is quite different. So it's harder for the interaction with the students as well, because I, at least in German, I sort of understand what they're asking, but Swiss German, I don't really. So that makes it a bit more difficult too. And oh, for my wife, she's Filipino, and she has a hard time with our, she, she thinks English is kind of easy, but we use so much slang all the time. We don't right. even realize we're using slang all the time. So do you throw that in there every now and then too, or you don't realize it? And <laughs> Yeah, uh, I try not to if I know someone's translating for me. I try and break it down. I mean, it, for me, in a way, it gives me also time to think, but it's, it's just when I'm teaching practical, it takes away some of the spontaneity. But with theory, I have to try and be quite precise because I know I can't go off on a tangent because someone's got to translate it. So... It can be helpful as well. Yep. And then um, you, you said you first got started in shiatsu then. Was it before you really got into pregnancy massage or was it the other way around then? I was doing some massage and then I got into shiatsu and then I got into, then, then I became pregnant myself and that's when I started trying to find out about pregnancy. But this was 21 my, well, in fact, my daughter's going to be 22 this year. So this was like over 22, well, 22 years ago in the pregnancy. And really, there wasn't much awareness of massage or shiatsu. The main thought that people had was, oh, maybe you shouldn't massage someone when they were pregnant. And I couldn't <laughs> really think. Of, and I just thought, well, surely it's a really good time to massage someone when they're pregnant because you're helping to support them. So... Things are starting to move. Yeah. Do you remember if there was any contraindications back in the day that that um, people don't believe now then compared to back then? Uh, it, well, it's the same kind of contraindications, but they were more widespread. There was more fear, more anxiety, and nobody, nobody, I would say, was really specialising in pregnancy massage. I mean, even pregnancy yoga wasn't really that well known. It was re it was just the beginning of the interest in all these things to do with pregnancy, I would say. And then some people I know that I've talked to that they're, sc they're scared to kind of add shiatsu and um, pregnancy massage together just because I think of the unknown too. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I say about the shiatsu is what the main things that I find that shiatsu brings to massage are partly just another set of techniques in the way that shiatsu involves a lot of quite static techniques and holding and a bit more, you know, still quiet techniques, which actually are really helpful for pregnant women to include that. And the other thing is I think sometimes people are 
are scared that they might work certain points, that they might do the wrong thing. But I actually say it's really, really hard to do the wrong thing with Shatsu if you're applying basic body work principles because all you ever are doing is helping the body to heal itself. That, that's really all you're doing with the meridians and the points. And So as long as you touch them in the right way, you can't do any harm. And even if you don't quite understand what you're actually doing, in a way that doesn't matter. That was how Shatsu developed. It developed out of the practical, out of the touch and understanding how the touch affected the body rather than the other way around. They didn't have a theory. They then tried to apply to the body. It developed from touch. So that's why I always try and encourage massage therapists to try and work with Shatsu. And I find they're often really good at it because hopefully... Massage therapists have good uh, touch skills. And, do and you, that is the basis for Shiatsu. Yep. And do you usually go over a lot of the acupressure points um, during um, Shiatsu when you do the training? Or just some of the basics related to um, pregnancy then? or? Yeah, I teach some of the main, they're, they're called extraordinary vessels. They're special meridians that relate to basically the reproductive system. So they, they're, they're meridians that affect the brain and the uterus, the womb, and in men, the male reproductive system. And the kidney energy, which for the Chinese is is our ancestral energy. So it's like our energetic DNA, really. So I teach them, actually, I try and teach them the whole circuit of those meridians and, not less, and, and some key points along the circuit, but it's really about balancing areas along the meridians. And then as well as that, I teach some of the specific points as well, yeah. And do you usually go as long, I mean, like an hour, hour and a half, two hours? How long is the average shiatsu um, pregnancy massage then? Or I tend to do about an hour and a quarter. Okay. Sometimes I do a bit longer. Okay. Yeah. But you usually schedule um, a longer two and stuff just because sometimes it's harder for a pregnant woman to get positioned or, or yeah. you know? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's good to allow a bit more time because it's harder. I mean, when they come every week or, you know, they come really regularly, then I, I get to know the cushions and things that they're likely to need. But, yeah, certainly the first time they come, you need to spend quite a while working out what's comfortable. And I do, especially in the third trimester, I tend to include some work over the ball. It's just like a gym ball. But it's just to get people leaning forwards and giving a bit more space to the pelvis. So that takes a bit of time to show people. So the first session's a bit longer getting everything positioned. But afterwards, it doesn't necessarily take such a long time because they're used to those positions and cushions. Um, but then the other thing is it's nice to let them have a rest at the end, especially if they're later on in pregnancy. Often they do get very relaxed and it's nice to not be rushing them off the table or the floor, wherever I'm working, and just give them a bit of time to just rest. Okay. And, and do you ever teach um, the, the spouses um, how to massage too, some basic stuff? Oh, yeah. I yeah. do a lot of that kind of work. In fact, um, I'm doing one next week for one of my neighbours, so that's quite handy because I like to try and do that in their houses if possible because then I can... In fact, this client of mine is going is having a hoping to have a home birth because we have home births are much more widespread in the UK, I think, than in the US. So I'm going to her house and we're going to go through all the different things that she can use for positions, so the ball and cushions and things like that. And then I'm going to show her partner things that he can do in different positions. That was actually how I started it, uh, my teaching. A lot of my teaching was with the partners, showing the partners massage and shatsu for labour and late pregnancy and also work with the baby because a lot of partners want to connect with the baby but they're not sure how much pressure they can apply to the abdomen and, you know, basic things like that. So that's also quite a big part of it. It's preparing for birth, things they can do in labour but also things they can do that help them connect with their baby, which hopefully then postnatally they'll start working with the baby, with baby 
massage because they'll already have got used to working a bit with baby. And and why do um why over there would you say that there's a lot more home births than over here then? I think because there's more midwives and also I suppose because people are nearer hospitals, so they've got you know they they they're not big uh, so isolated perhaps. So it's easier to get to a hospital if you need to go to a hospital. So they feel they've got that back up there. I think part of it's a cultural thing as well, though, with the midwives and the whole support for natural birth. Because I know yeah. in the States it can be hard. If people don't want to go to hospital, sometimes it's hard to get midwifery support for a home birth, isn't it? Yeah, because I, 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 I know many people that, that want to do home births, but, yeah, it is a little bit harder and... You have to find the right midwife or the right doctor to allow it and stuff too. So yeah, yeah, but it's yeah. <laughs> and and do you ever have doctors um, do it too, or is it just midwives then usually? Oh, the doc, the ob well, we, yeah, the obstetricians. Um, well, I've sometimes I've had obstetricians coming on my birth preparation courses, which is really great, and they're always a bit well, always. Some of them have been a bit skeptical and thought, oh, I can't really see how pressing this point can do anything and then when they actually have used it in labor sometimes they've come back and said wow this was really amazing I didn't really believe what you said and now I can see how it um, how it all works and sometimes when I've worked in hospitals I usually teach the midwives first of all uh, because they're the ones that are with with the women in that kind of context where they can use shiatsu but some of the obstetricians, when they see how effective it is, then they start sending women to the midwives and say, oh, yeah, maybe you could try having some massage or some shiatsu. So it is getting through to them as well. Is water births um, popular over there at all? Yeah, water births are quite popular over here. Most hospitals have a pool in them. Oh, they do? Okay. Yeah. And do most hospitals over there have massage therapists? Um or <laughs> uh, not working not so much but what they do do is quite a lot of midwives have trained in some sort of complementary therapy so massage is quite a big one aromatherapy is another popular one for midwives reflexology is another popular one and shatsu i've been trying to get to do them to be aware of as well so i've trained quite i do a course shatsu for midwives Okay. As well as I teach massage to midwives, but shiatsu for midwives. So getting the midwives to use massage is really something that's taking off here. And are you a doula also then? Yeah, I mean, I started working with birth support before the doula movement started. So I tend to call it birth support. But okay. I, I, <laughs> now, now because I do so much teaching and teaching abroad, I don't really get much chance to do birth support work myself to, 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 to be a doula but I do have links with doula UK and I train massage therapists uh, and actually some of the doulas do shatsu, my shatsu course because they want to learn some extra skills for supporting women in labour. And, and are um, doulas allowed to give massages then so there's not a lot of regulations with that then or? No, I mean, it isn't that regulated. If so, Basically, if the woman wants to take someone else into the hospital with her or have someone else at home, then they are quite open about that, the hospitals. As long as you have a midwife supporting or an obstetrician supporting, they then let the woman do whatever else she wants. Okay. And, and do you ever include, uh, include any kind of spa modalities or at all with pregnancy? Spa, like... Yeah. Uh, like salt scrubs, body wraps, any of those kind of things. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. Personally, I don't, because I do, I combine shiatsu, but people do do that, and in spa treatments, they, they do include those kind of things for pregnant women. And then, what are your books about, then? My books, I've written one, which is shiatsu for midwives, which is about explaining how people that aren't trained... Um, haven't done a full training in shiatsu can use aspects of shiatsu in their work and so I explain the basic concepts of shiatsu and the things that you were saying about like how how do you get people to how you sort of demystify shiatsu and simplify it and make it accessible 
to more people. So that's the Shatsu for midwives because I do, I do quite a lot of work with midwives. Then I also wrote a book for parents because that's the other thing, the birth preparation. That's one of my big um, things because, again, I feel it's not necessarily always possible for the massage therapist to be present during the birth. But hopefully the partner, the woman's partner, who is often the father, is going to be present. So it's great if he can have a positive role. And then the third book I've written is my book for practitioners, so for massage therapists and shiatsu practitioners, and that's called Pregnancy and Childbirth, and that's focusing really on everything to do with working with pregnant women from taking the uh, the taking the case history we call the consultation so the intake forms all the way through to how you liaise with people in in hospital and then all the practical techniques in between okay and, and then um, with your books are they um, ebooks at all too or just physical forms at the moment, they're just physical forms. Oh, actually, no. My third book, the book for practitioners, is interestingly enough, is on Kindle. So okay. you can download it. I'm, I haven't actually tried doing that because I'm not quite sure how the pictures will come out, but you can download it. But I'm thinking of doing maybe something more like ebooks and shortened versions of the books. Yeah, just because for United States, if we're going to be ordering from over there, it's going to be a little bit expensive to ship. So. <laughs> I don't, I don't think it is too expensive, oh, actually. It? I think when I came to the States in the summer, someone said she'd ordered a book and got it within about two or three days. So I think the company that has published my book is an international company. It's Elsevier. Have you heard of Elsevier? Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 So they've got depots all over the world. So I think they ship large numbers of books out and then supply from the States. So I, I think both the shipping is quite quick and also the cost isn't really that much more. And um, do, do people use your book in massage schools, do you know? They're beginning to, but in massage schools here, the training isn't necessarily as long. The basic training isn't necessarily as long as in the States. So people do a basic training and then they tend to specialize after they've done their basic training. So I'm the main person that tends to do the pregnancy work, but people are using the book. Yeah, and over here in the United States, I mean... Some of the schools don't even teach pregnancy massage. I mean, it seems such a basic thing, but I mean, some people, some schools are just so short they just don't even have it. Yeah, I was going to say because it depends. There's a lot of things to teach, aren't there, on a massage program? Yeah. And so, yeah, it's the same. In, it's the same in in the UK. Or they might just do a couple of hours or a day or something like that. Yeah. And if what's what's your goals for the future then for this? For my own personal work or for generally for massage and pregnancy? Yeah, both. <laughs> in, in my own personal work, I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of planning out some DVDs because I think that, again, like you say, in, in terms of ebooks, it's also um, people being able to see the techniques and how I work with women. So I want to put some of that on DVDs. So I'm in the process of working some of those out. So if anyone out there has contacts for, D for DVDs and distributing especially, because I'll probably, I've got someone that, that professionally makes DVDs, so I'm going to use them, but I'm going to have to self-fund that. So I need to make sure I sell enough of them. Yep. So that's one project. <laughs> Um, and then just to keep spreading the word and getting more people um, working with pregnant women. And so part of my that is then my goal for pregnancy massage is for it to become more widely known, to be more accepted, for it to become more a routine part of antenatal care for women, or prenatal care, you call it, don't you? We call it antenatal care, prenatal care, because I just think it's so, 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 so helpful and... There's so many things that women, uh, how to put it, well, things like backache. If a woman goes to the doctors or the midwife, then often they're told, oh, yeah, that's part of being pregnant. You're going to have backache. You're going to have aches and pains. You're not going to feel so great. And I just feel, no, there's no reason why most pregnant women should have any kind of backache. Massage is really effective for sorting out backache in pregnancy and lots of other complaints of pregnancy 
can be resolved with with massage so to have it more widely known and more accessible for more pregnant women all over the world really not just in and, and not just women that can afford to pay for it so I'd like it to be part of the healthcare systems so even women on lower incomes can have access to massage okay and then um, Phyllis in the chat asked um, will C's um, continuing education credits be available with your DVDs you think or oh yeah that, that actually that's something I need to get working on yes I'll try and get the online courses accredited yes okay yeah. And is there any kind of certification over there in in England and stuff? And in pregnancy massage? No, just in general. I mean, here we get like the national boards and the um, the M Blacks. We have, those are the two big certifications here. But do you have any like national certification over there at all? Yeah, the problem with the UK is at the moment there's a few different kind of bodies that certify massage. So we're in the process of trying to bring them all together in more of one one group so there's a there's a few too many different groups especially for such a small country and then there's also a group that's working with been working with the government which is trying to regulate um not just massage but all main complementary therapies so massage shiatsu um reflexology even things like yoga we're trying to get them more regulated and that's through the not through statutory regulation, but through voluntary regulation, but working with the government, and that's the complementary and natural healthcare council. But that's only been set up a couple of years ago. And do you think that would help if there was more regulation then, or? Well, the aim of that that body is that it, to give it to give the public more confidence that if they go and see someone they know that they're properly qualified and properly insured. Okay. Because there are people... The problem in the UK at the moment is we have this law whereby as long as you're not practising medicine, you can kind of pretty much do anything that you want, whether or not you're properly qualified to do it. So although most people wouldn't, it's, it's a bit of a grey area. So we're trying to get... You know, you can have people just practicing that haven't done proper training, that haven't done insurance. And then obviously that gives quite a bad name to massage if they're not very good and someone goes to see them, but they might, they're probably not regulated. So we're trying to get more regulation so people know that there are registers and that people have to have certain initials after their name and that there's a professional body that they can complain to if there's any problems. So we're getting there. Okay. We are getting there. <laughs> and, and do you get into infant massage much then? Yeah, uh, infant massage is another of my main um, areas of passion because, like I said, I think um, part of my working with partners is to teach them to be connected with the baby during the pregnancy through touch. And then I continue that um, in the postnatal period, um, incorporating massage for the mother and the, and the father to do with the baby again I think that's a really important supporting their development and again especially when there's so many babies these days that are just put in push chairs or baby seats and they're not really out there just kicking around and playing and moving and being touched and carried and held so for me massage is part of encouraging a more physical direct contact with the baby. And is the infant massage popular over there then or is it just performed here and there kind of thing or just to teach the parents how to massage or Again, it's get it's getting more popular because um, we have the same organization the IAIN the infant Associ the International Association of Infant Massage has uh, has chapters over here as well and we have infant yoga and cranial sacral work and things like that. So there is much more of an awareness of working with the babies and birth trauma, working after difficult births and working to support development. Well, a birth, I mean, um, infant yoga, what, what does that entail? I've never heard of that before. Oh, right. Yeah. That's basically, <laughs> it's gentle stretches and movements for babies. Okay. You... The mum can do, the mum can do, um, with the baby, so she could be doing yoga herself, 
and do it with the baby, or she can just do it with the baby as part of baby massage. And is there a certain age frame? I mean, once they start crawling, it's harder to do all this stuff then, or...? Yeah, well, yeah. once they start crawling, it, you have to adapt. It is a yeah. bit harder. So it's good to start. I always think it's good to start really early on. Obviously, you don't do so much stretching early on because the, ba the baby's doing a lot of movements, just uncurling from the fetal position. But um, as the baby starts to move, the stretching, because I do a lot of work with the, with the massage and with the shatsu in terms of stretching and facilitating, Basically, it's facilitating movement of the baby. So you don't want to force the baby to do movements they're not doing, but you're just encouraging them in the movements. And just encouraging parents. To, but basic things like um, often babies, they put the babies always on the same side or the baby's facing a window in their room where they sleep, so they always look on one side. So they start getting kind of um, out of balance with the alignment. They're always turning the head one way. So just encouraging the parents to just encourage the baby to do movements to the other side basic things like that as well can make a big difference too so that's what the stress yeah so the yoga stretching whatever we do is basically to support the baby in their in their development okay so it's just more like rhythmic movements maybe too or yeah some yeah. of that i mean yeah following the rhythm of the baby yeah and then um sometimes we include singing and clapping and things like that with it Okay, cool. So it's a bit like structured play, you know, playing with the baby. The aim is to try and make it, it fun and a way of supporting playing and interaction between the parents and the baby, as well as the development of the baby. Now, I think infant, mas um, infant yoga sounds cooler than infant massage. So. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, for the pregnant women and stuff, I mean, it looks like you teach like um, self-healing exercises, breathing, relaxation. How yeah. do you get them to follow through, though, on doing these things on their own and stuff? Uh, well, I try and frame it in a way like if they have backache, I say, well, in a way, it's quite good you've got backache because it reminds you that you have to look after your back and you're motivated. And, you know, it motivates them to do something every day. So I find that in pregnancy is quite a good time to be motivated because they do know if they don't do the stretches and the breathing and the exercise – then they're st likely to start developing aches and pains in their body. So there is quite a strong motivation just from that fact. And especially these days, a lot of women are in jobs which involve sitting down at a desk, which actually isn't very comfortable when you're pregnant. So I always give them, basically I give them exercises they can integrate in their, into their day-to-day -day activities. So you know, getting up, from the desk every half an hour or so and doing a bit of stretching and movement and because they know it helps their backache then that's a good motivating factor okay. and position of the baby is another good motivating factor if they know i would say to them how the baby develops in the womb is a lot of it is through movement so if you're sat down all day then the baby's not getting very much movement. So I'm encouraging them to think about how their movement is helping the baby move as well and helping their baby develop. And then when you're over here in the United States, um, you talk to other massage therapists. Did, did you compare what you, you guys do over there compared to over here then too? Or is there any differences or similarities? Or Yeah, there's some differences and some similarities. I mean, I think some of the differences are that... Um, Birth and pregnancy is a bit more medical, I would say, in the States than it is over here. So we tend to do... So although you have massage and yoga and things like that, I think here um, there's possibly a bit less less fear somehow and, and also more of an idea that you don't necessarily need to have a huge amount of medical care in pregnancy if there's nothing the matter with you. If you're basically healthy and fit and well, then there isn't really much that needs to be done medically. Most of it is looking after yourself through good, obviously things like exercise and posture and movement, but basics like diet and relaxation and all these kind of things. And the emphasis on that aspect rather than 
lots of tests and medical care. So I think that that's a big difference. And the fact that midwives, a lot of women will mostly just see the midwife and the midwife focuses more on what we could say are the normal aspects of pregnancy and birth rather than the high risk or the medical. And I think in America, because people see the obstetrician more, they tend to get a bit more focused on problems and risks and things like that. And that carries on into the massage. So I think people find when, I, when I'm teaching in America, they're surprised at how much we can do because they, they, they're often a bit afraid of really exploring the full possibilities and potential, I think, of massage. Yeah, because yeah, even over here, sometimes um, a lot of therapists are f afraid about massaging in the first trimester too. Is that the case over there then? or? Yes and no. I think, again, it's gradually changing and people are realizing that actually the first trimester is an important time to work. And really, I say to people, well, women aren't told to give up stressful jobs. So women are doing quite stressful things in their day-to-day -day life. And actually, massage may be the only time in the week where they have time to really relax and really connect with themselves and actually to de-stress so actually, it's really important in the first trimester because that's when the baby's growing and developing and forming. So we know that stress is not good for the body and stress affects the hormonal system. So in order to support the body and the baby and the hormonal changes, actually massage is really helpful in terms of helping to reduce stress levels. So I present it more in that kind of way. And also because actually massage is really good when you include, even just massage, relaxing massage can really help reduce feelings of sickness. And then if you include some of the shatsu acupuncture points, it can be really amazing. So women can actually feel so much better from having a massage in the first trimester. Of course, you have to make, for some women, you have to make certain adaptations, but I always think it's a shame if women have been having regular massage before they're pregnant that they stop in the first trimester. That seems a bit strange to me. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I think it's more of a fear too because um, a lot of people say the it's more likely for the miscarriage in the first trimester, so that scares people instantly and stuff. And, it, yeah. Miscarriage is, is more likely in the first trimester, but massage is not going to increase the risk of miscarriage. And if anything, we have to be careful that we don't claim this but because there aren't any studies to prove it. But my feeling is that it's likely, it's more likely to have an effect of reducing miscarriage just simply because it's supporting the body. So if you support the body, then you help the body function more effectively. Yep. And is so there I any... never claim that, but okay. I always say that actually, why would massage be unhelpful in the first trimester? And is it's likely to be of benefit, yep. not of harm. Is there much research that's going on that, um, in the past or even in the future, would you say, with pregnancy massage? or? I think you possibly you are better off at doing the research in the States. We don't have so many massage projects, um, research projects in the UK at the moment. We've had some projects on the applications of specific points, like acupuncture points, but not so much on massage. That's that's an area, I mean, actually, you were saying what might be my hope would be, I mean, I actually was trying to set up a big research project with my local hospital that was on Shatsu, but that would be my hope is that there is more research to validate uh, the benefits of massage and also that shows that there isn't harm that's caused by massage because as therapists we know that but it's just proving it and selling it to the the primary care providers isn't it convincing them of the benefits and of the low risks there aren't really any risks in having massage but there are many risks in having medical treatments yep. and then uh, Phyllis in the chat asked um, Please ask her to include first first trimester points regarding like helping with nausea and other things when she makes her DVD. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, you, do you have a kind of an outline? Well, 
there's yeah. one on the you probably know it and it is actually a point that has been researched a lot it's the pericardium or heart protector six you just get three fingers widths from the wrist fold and it's between usually it's between the tendons and you don't want to press it very hard but that's where they put the c bands for sickness and that's a great point for um, morning sickness and the other one is just holding on the sternum is quite a good one and then holding on the sternum and then holding on the abdomen and breathing and relaxing and then there's points on below the knees that might be a bit harder to show stomach 36 for people that know their meridians yep <laughs> is there any other specific points that are really good for the pregnant mom then um, well, the main ones, and so people might want to look this up because I've written quite a bit about it, are points on what we call the extraordinary vessels. So they're the main regulating vessels of the reproductive system that I was talking about at the beginning. And actually, Heart Protector 6 is one of those points. And then opposite it, Triple Heater 5 is another one. And then we've got a lung point on the hand, just on the wrist again. Um, and then there's the, actually it's points around the ankle or the wrists and points around the ankles are some other points and I know in reflexology sometimes people are a bit scared of working around the ankles because they relate to the reproductive system but that's precisely I would say why we want to work then because we want to support the reproductive system so uh, around the ankles you've got points on the kidney meridian so they're useful to work to support these the flow of these meridians which help to regulate most things to do with pregnancy and I remember for my wife for the our second kid she was a ha having a hard time producing milk I mean there's oh, yeah. points for those things too and yeah yeah, yeah. Know. I mean with breastfeeding I always there are points that are really helpful and one of these meridians actually goes across the breasts and um, we can work that to support milk. So there's points that help to su support the flow of milk, so if things are getting a bit stuck. So the points that support the flow of milk will, are also really helpful for preventing mastitis because it's helping the flow. And there's points that also, the other key aspect is supporting the quality and the quantity of the milk. So that's related a lot to building up um, yeah, the quality of the milk. But the main thing that we'd say that is that obviously it's really important to work alongside um, how the woman is in her day-to-day -day life. Because, of course, um, the most important thing about the quality of the milk is the food that the woman is eating. So you'd need to give you know, check that she is actually eating the right kind of food, the right amounts of food. And along with that is often the fact is she getting enough rest? Is she sitting down and eating? Or is she just trying to do too many things? I, I find that's one of the main problems for women postnatally with breastfeeding is just making sure they have the time to look after themselves. They're not just focusing on the baby because in order to feed the baby, they need to be feeding themselves and nourishing themselves. So again, massage is really helpful postnatally for just giving them some time to focus on themselves and get a bit of rest and relaxation as well. And is there any points to reduce cravings? Because that's a big problem. <laughs> a lot of pregnant women complain about that. Oh, Cra cravings. Yeah, so yeah. Cravings are often due to some kind of imbalance. Uh, could be mineral imbalance or, or vitamin imbalance or something like that. So I'd always look at the food and the drinks that women are having as well as working um, specific points and areas to focus on that, yeah. So is, I'd always look at the whole person, why are they craving? I don't like to focus just on a one technique or one point. It's really looking at the whole person, why that craving might be arising. It could be more on an emotional level or a physical level or whatever. So it's looking at what's going on behind the craving. And is there any certain positioning devices that you prefer for using for a pregnant woman? For me, yes. I I don't specially like 
the cushions for prone positioning that much. So I tend to favour more side positioning. So I've got loads of different shapes and size bolsters and cushions and things for the side position because I, I really, really like working in the side position and I find my, my clients get really comfortable in the side position. And the other one is later on in pregnancy, like I say, I use the ball and forward leaning. But So the ball, a lot of pregnant women do like the ball because they can rock and move and, and get some relaxation that way. But some people don't. Some people like something more stable. So then I'll find other ways that they can be leaning forward. So uh, leaning over a chair, leaning over the side of a massage table. So they're sat on the ball or sat on a chair. But just encouraging them to lean forward, but not lie forward. So I don't like the prone position. Because even with cushions, I find it's a bit restrictive of the abdomen. So forward leaning gives space to the abdomen and takes the weight off the sacrum in a way that prone positioning, even with cushions, I don't find does. And um, do a lot of therapists over there use the body support systems or anything? Or? Uh, some do, some don't. More shatsu practitioners, I would say, use it, the massage therapist, the body support system. But they do, some massage therapists use the tables with the holes cut out as well. It's not massively, massively popular here, but some people do use it. Yeah, and I don't see on the pregnancy tables around much anymore. Back in the day when they first came out, I saw them a lot, but I know some instructors don't like using them or they think it's actually harmful and stuff, so... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think you have to be really careful with them, to be honest. And, and it is true that a lot of pregnant women do quite like lying prone. But then you can't really apply much pressure to the sacrum and the lower back, which is where often they need deeper, you know, more physical work to release tightness and tension. So I think you have to be really careful with them. Sometimes for like certain specific techniques or to give them a bit of time on their on their abdomen, it may be okay, but I think you do have to be really careful if you use pro. And um, what I've been hearing too is that they're not as specific now with one side or the other. I mean, back in the day, when I went through massage school, they said, try not to have a lot on, on laying on the right side. Yeah. yeah. Now they, well, well, now it's, yeah. I don't know where that myth came from in the first place, to be honest. I mean, it's true that if someone starts, um, if they're lying on their back and their blood pressure starts dropping, you do need to put them on the left-hand side. But other than that, um, it makes sense that you put them on both sides because there's so many reasons why. Well, firstly, structurally, it's not very good if they're just lying on one side all the time. From the mother's point of view, they're going to start getting hip problems or shoulder problems. But from the baby's point of view, you know I was telling you about how the baby develops through movement, um, more encouraging movement after the baby's born. But even in the womb, even in pregnancy, that's largely how the baby is developing through movement. So if the mother's only lying on one side, that's not great for the baby's development either. So, yeah, I don't know where the myth came from, but uh, we we don't we, we work with people on both sides. I, I basically find it's... It's about talking to the woman and finding what side she's more comfortable on. And, how, you know, some women do tend to favour one side, but it's not actually always the left. I've sometimes had clients that aren't very comfortable lying on their left-hand side. And is aromatherapy <laughs> kind of shunned in the, for a pregnant woman? or Aromatherapy? Yeah. No, actually, aromatherapy is very popular. And I think that comes from the fact that a lot of midwives have studied aromatherapy. And there is a big hospital in Oxford, I'm sure you've all heard of Oxford, where the university is, the famous Oxford University. There's a, a, a big teaching hospital called the John Radcliffe Hospital. And one of the midwives there introduced aromatherapy, m mostly using oils, certain oils, and, and did some research projects. So actually aromatherapy is fairly popular, but more for more for labour, I suppose, and more in, you know, during birth itself. But I think that's had a knock-on effect to aromatherapy in pregnancy as well. 
So yeah. it's fairly popular around therapy. And I think over here, I think it's just a fear thing too, because again, most massage schools they don't have a lot of training in aromatherapy and. They're just not totally sure and stuff, so that's why I think a lot of times we just um, shy on the side of uh, safety just to be safe all the time. And, yeah. You know, and it's frustrating because, again, I mean, there's so much benefit out there with all these different modalities. And, I know. It yeah. is frustrating, especially when you think, you know, what are the side effects of any of these things? You know, even aromatherapy oils, as long as you're, re you, you're careful and you know what you're doing and you have certain checks and balances, they're not really going to cause harm in the way that we use them. Whereas um, drugs, you know, medical drugs, can cause harm and medical interventions can cause harm. So I think the fear is somewhat misplaced, to be honest. Yeah, because with medical drugs, it kills thousands and thousands of people a year just... I mean, prescription drugs. You know? <laughs> well, exactly, that's yeah, what I mean. Yeah, so people yeah. start talking about massage and aromatherapy being unsafe. And I say, well, hang on a minute. What actually, what harm do you think they can really cause? Yeah. And for doula training over there, is there a lot of, do you have to go for a lot of schooling at all? Or is it like a weekend seminar? Or It's fairly short training, to be honest, yeah. It's usually a couple of weekend seminars and then attending births and writing up births and being uh, sort of supervised in your practice. But it's not a huge amount of training. And here, too, it's not a lot, too, so it sounds like about the same. And do you guys um, get into postpartum doulas at all, too? I mean, yeah, yeah. doula we, training and stuff? Yeah, you know. yeah. You, you, can train to, you can train to be a prenatal doula or a birth doula or a postpartum doula so uh, some of the people that I've trained are postpartum doulas and you know they go in and do go in daily and they do things like housework actually as well they're not just going in and doing massage they yeah. do housework and massage oh cool so they can yeah and um does insurance pay for that over there at all or is it mostly people have to pay out of their own pockets or mostly people pay out of their own pockets yeah mm -hmm. But just imagine a doula and a massage therapist. I mean, I mean it's a double whammy. I mean, that's a nice benefit to have. <laughs> well, it's yeah, great. I yeah. think that's what everybody should have, actually. That should yeah. be paid for as part of the health system because it actually it would help prevent a lot of health problems developing in the future if women had support in the postnatal period. In Holland, actually, um, in the Netherlands, I'm going to teach in, in Amsterdam tomorrow, actually, so I was thinking of the Netherlands. They do have these helpers, which I've mentioned in my book, actually. I can't remember the Dutch name because I never learned Dutch. Um, uh, and they go in and support women for about 10 days to two weeks, I think, after birth. So it's like having a, every, you know, every woman gets, essentially, it's a postpartum doula, and they go in and look after the woman and do the shopping or look after other children. And I just think that's everybody should have one of those. And, and like you say, especially if they did massage as well, then women could get a massage every day and just think of the benefit that that would provide. And then somebody in the chat asked, um, are you aware of any male doulas at all? And do male therapists tend to leave pregnancy massage to female therapists, would you say? Yeah, I mean, there are a few... Male, male doulas. I don't know about male doulas. There are a few male midwives. There aren't many male therapists that work a lot with pregnancy. On my courses, sometimes I get one or two men doing the course, but by far the majority of women of people working in the field are women, I would say. But I try and encourage male massage therapist to do birth preparation work and to do the partner work and to work with the fathers because I think that's quite a, a nice thing for them to do. Yeah, that would be huge because, again, the average male, I mean, they give their wife a, a minute massage and then that's it. They think it's, that's enough kind of thing. and <laughs> Or they start getting sore after a minute and it's just like, come on. <laughs> yeah, but exactly. And if it's, a, if it's a male therapist that's showing them, and encouraging them, I think that could be quite a nice way in. Yeah, that'd be huge for a role model like that and yeah. stuff. So, yeah, exactly. You know, 
And um, for for midwives, I mean, is there a lot of training with midwives over there too? Then would you say? I mean, it's basic over here. It's a, it's an RN plus a bunch of extra education and stuff. And oh, okay. To be a midwife, they 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 change the system, or they've tried to make it now so it's an independent profession. So you don't necessarily have to train to be a nurse first. Oh, wow. So they, yeah, because what they realize, I mean, if you want to be a midwife, you don't necessarily need to do a nurse training because the whole nurse training is is focusing on ill people, really, isn't it? Whereas pregnant women, hopefully most of them, aren't ill. And what you need to do as a midwife is totally different from what you need to do as a nurse. So you can do, they call it direct entry midwifery so you can just go straight into a midwifery program which is the equivalent of a degree you can do degree level midwifery so you do a three-year training full-time training and then you're qualified as a midwife wow. <laughs> and you don't have to do the nurse training wow. so I think the training for midwives actually is probably more detailed here in the UK yeah, that definitely is understandable, yeah. Because over here for nursing, um, for RNs, there's a two-year degree and then also four-year degree, and sometimes they have to have extra training to be in midwives and stuff above that, so. Yeah, yeah when they did it, with, when you had to be a nurse in the UK, you do the three, I think it's three years nursing, and then you do another 18 months as a midwife. Okay. But now they, you can do it just through the midwifery training, which is better because you learn what you need to be a midwife. And is there any uh, major contraindications for pregnancy massage then? Uh, the major ones. I mean, I always say to people, the, well, the major things I would say is, is if the woman needs medical treatment, and there are cases, certain situations where the woman does need emergency medical treatment. And so if you're working as a pregnancy massage therapist, you need to be able to recognize all those signs so that you know if the woman needs to be in hospital or not. But to be honest, it's, it's fairly common sense things like if she's bleeding or if she's having premature contractions or uh, if she's fitting, which is one of the symptoms of preeclampsia, when I think the woman would tend to go to the hospital anyway rather than to come and have a massage. So it's, it's really just in those situations because even high-risk women, I find if they're in the hospital and receiving their appropriate medical treatment, as long as it's not an emergency situation, you can usually provide some benefit from massaging. So I've often gone into hospitals and worked with women who are high risk with massage and, and it helps with things like lowering the blood pressure, um, improving kidney function. You know, some of these you can see by the results that are coming back from the tests that are being done because they're being monitored and you can see the effects, the beneficial effects of massage. And would you say doctors and midwives and stuff are they're socially acceptable of massage therapists even working in hospitals or it depends on the doctor. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's but, the safe way out. <laughs> <laughs> but no, there, I mean there is there is a, a is I mean, yes, I think the open some of them are open minded and they can see the benefits and they're really um, pro massage and they encourage people to get massage and they they're quite open about letting massage therapists come into the hospital as long as they see that you're working together with them you're not trying to substitute their treatment that you recognize the value of what they do and you're working alongside them that's always what I try to encourage but of course there are always going to be some obstetricians and some midwives who feel that we're that we're interfering and that it's not part of our role and that that working with pregnant women and birthing women is the prerogative of only of midwives and obstetricians so we're never going to be able to convert everybody unfortunately I always say to, to people that work with me, you know, try it, work with the ones that are open-minded because some of them will never change their minds. So you have to start where there's an opening and build on that. Yep, and also respect the hierarchy too and stuff. So, yeah, yep, that's a big thing. 
Well, recognise that ultimately in the UK, the midwife and the obstetrician is the one who's legally liable if anything does go wrong with the pregnancy. So, you know, recognise we, we, as massage therapists, we're lucky in that we don't have to take that responsibility. So, we, it's yeah, it's recognising where our, our role is in the system. And do you guys purchase liability insurance over there too then, or...? Yeah, we have to, well, if we want to be part of a professional association, we have to have uh, full insurance, yeah. Okay. So um, the, your future stuff, you're going to be getting into DVDs really soon then, would you say? or? Hopefully. Okay. Hopefully this year we'll have some. <laughs> yeah. But as, as my, um, the woman who's hopefully going to be making them for me says, it always takes longer than you think it's going to take. And people think it's very easy to make a DVD, but actually to make a really good one, it's it's quite a lot of work. So we'll yeah. see. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's usually e really easy shooting it, but editing, that's the, yeah, yeah that's, that's a I'm long saying. time. <laughs> and any other books that you're going to be writing in the near future too? or? Oh, yeah, I'm working on a book. It'll probably take a bit longer, which is all about... In fact, it's what I was talking about, is about uh, how babies develop in the womb and then how we, they develop in the first year of their life through movement. So it's a lot about linking infant development with um, the development of meridians. That's a book, but that's quite a big theoretical book to write, so Whoa. it might take me a few years. And then coming to the States, you might come this year, but more likely in 2013 or... Yeah, I'll pretty definitely come in 2013, and I'm I'm quite booked up this year in Europe, and I'm going to Australia. I go to Australia every couple of years, or, and New Zealand to teach. Oh, you do? Well, <laughs> is there any continent? I'm also, I, sorry, I'm also trying to go to Brazil and Argentina, because I speak Spanish. I, t I teach in Spain, so I'm trying to do some work in South America to get the word spread there. <laughs> and then Phyllis in the um, chat asked, we were taught that we have to be careful not to massage the legs with much pressure, particularly the inner thighs. Is this a precaution taught in the UK at all? Uh, not so much. I mean, we have to check. Obviously, we take into account varicose veins. We take into account if there's a history of deep vein thrombosis or if there's any possible chance that there might be a thrombosis. But other than that, we just work with the pressure that feels appropriate for the woman clearly if the woman has edema you don't give very strong pressure but if and and on the inner thigh you don't give a strong pressure anyway do you as on the outer thigh so yeah. you but no uh not especially but i encourage a lot of movement and mobilization of the legs as well during the massage so to help support the circulation okay so i'm not just relying on pressure but yeah um, being aware of sensitivity and the amount of pressure, but not uh, not to quite the extent that I think that you're cautious in the states. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you then? Oh, through my website, probably. So that's wellmother.org. Okay. W e w l m o t h e r. Okay. And so there's no other projects you have? I mean, it seems like you have a lot in your plate already then. So. <laughs> <laughs> other projects? Why, what sort of things were you thinking Are, are you going to be teaching other people to teach um, pregnancy massage then too? Or? Oh, I, d I did have a program to do that. But then, um, yeah, it's it can be a bit difficult because I teach in so many different countries. But, I, yeah, I mean, I, I am supporting other people to do some of the work and teaching and supporting other people. Yeah, that's that's partly why I wrote the book and partly why I want to do the DVDs. Okay, so to get it out there even more then, right? So Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I don't have to travel to all the countries myself. Yeah. <laughs> so Although are, I like traveling, but yeah. there's no way I could be in all different places all over the world. Yeah. So are you gonna, it'll have to be China, really, won't it? We'll have to try and convert the Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> have, you been, have you been to most continents already then, or...? I've been, yeah, I have been to most continents, but I haven't taught in all continents. I, I, a few years ago, someone was trying to set something up for me in India, so maybe that will happen. Or uh, Singapore is another place, but they have, they've not quite worked out so far. Wow. But I have, trained, I have got some therapists who 
have done my courses who've come from places like Hong Kong and Singapore. So maybe the work will start to spread there. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well it's, it's been an absolute pleasure tonight talking to you again. <laughs> and um, and I hope you can get, go back to sleep then, right, too, right? <laughs> it, I just noticed my screen is 4 o'clock here. Yep. <laughs> so I have to go sleep, so I have to get up again in a few hours. Okay, so... The same, Stop, thank okay. you very much for staying up tonight, though. So. Yeah, great. <laughs> yeah. Thanks very much. Nice talking to you again. Yeah. And if anyone has any questions um, that they think about after they've heard the interview, then do feel free to email me. Okay, thanks. Via the website, yeah. Yep, yeah. and thanks, everybody. Thanks, okay. Yeah. Good night. Take care. Yeah. Good night.